What's happening, everybody? Brian Silva for Advia PJ. Today, I'm honored to bring in a very special guest, uh, EOD technician for multiple years. Um, he's the guy that runs the uh, joint EOD page for Instagram. So he came all the way down here so we can shoot a video, get you guys information that you need about EOD specifically, so share some of his experiences, and hopefully motivate you guys a little bit to join EOD. Again, I'm not just about you guys, everyone's going to be a PJ because I realize that not everybody is meant to be a PJ. Some people are meant to be an EOD. Some people are meant to do other jobs. Whatever it is that you're going to want to do, um, we want you to do with all your passion and make sure that you're doing the right job and making stuff happen to save people and make sure that everyone comes home. So without further ado, right here I have uh, Merritt Davey, uh, current active duty EOD personnel um, and I appreciate him being here. If you can go ahead and just introduce yourself Absolutely. and tell yeah, us a little bit about me. you. Yeah, thanks for having me down, Brian. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, uh, like Brian said, I'm Merritt Davey. I've uh, been an EOD technician about five years. I've uh, just been at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base, North Carolina that whole time. So uh, background on me, I was a military brat before I joined. Um, just been something I've been into my whole life. Uh, actually waiting on an air crew job before I enlisted. I uh, was getting impatient with waiting on jobs, and EOD was open, so I just kind of hopped in willy-nilly, and here we are, yeah. Ah, so you got lucky, and you're just like, you know what, EOD, I don't want to do this air crew thing, like, oh, yeah. let's go, something that I can put my hands on, and, you know. Like... I wanted to be a helo gunner, yeah. and that was just cut, the <laughs> AFSC just got cut, like, they yeah. weren't taking anybody. Um, and then I asked, you know, who deploys a lot and doesn't have to swim. That was my, my two criteria right there. So <laughs> uh, TACP was taken six months to get shipped. And EOD, I went down to the shop in Charleston at the time, about 2012, 2011. Um, all their technicians were, were gone, uh, deployed or TDY. And seeing that, that was exactly what I was looking for. So I just I hopped on without really knowing much else. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome, man. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you got a decent amount of experience from just being EOD. And that's also an important thing to remember for other guys. You know, sometimes it just happens to, that you find a job that you end up enjoying and you even get to deploy more often than if you were in a different job that you were, you know, whatever, air crew or whatever. So. Absolutely, yeah. This is uh, it's definitely provided me more stepping stones to other stuff I'm looking to pursue than any other job I, I saw out there. So. Sweet. Um so specifically, um, can you tell us a little bit more? Because I know everyone's seen the Hurt Locker. Everyone's seen, you know, the documentary. Kind of, that's all. <laughs> everyone has this picture. At least for me, it's like this picture of a dude in a big old suit that's going up and trying to mess with these little wires. And that's kind of what most people, you know, picture. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a lot more to the whole EOD world. Definitely. So if you don't mind, just like some of the jobs that you guys do as EOD techs and a little bit of the the different things that you can expect like day to day. Sure, yeah. So we have uh, nine distinct mission sets for Air Force specifically. Um, anything from a hand grenade to a nuclear weapon. We can uh, build, dismantle, uh, render safe, mitigate, or dispose. So uh, like you're talking about with the mm -hmm. guy in the bomb suit uh, messing with wires, that's definitely a mission set, and that was uh, what got us into the, the limelight somewhat mm -hmm. at, when the GWAT started. Uh, but there's just so much more going on with EOD. Uh, stateside, we support uh, local, federal, and state police um, with uh, UXO responses, uh, unexploded ordnance. Uh, we do Secret Service support missions for the president doing explosive sweeps. Um, we just we integrate with uh, SOCOM, uh, just different uh, other EOD branches. Uh, every branch has EOD, so we integrate all with each other in training, uh, operational missions, just the whole shebang. We, we do it. So. So that is a ton of different mission sets. Um, if you don't mind just explaining in the realm of the special warfare that they're calling it now, kind of where do you guys fall, um, I guess, as far as like supporters, operators kind of thing, and where would we be expected to you know, fall in the echelon of deployments and kind of stuff? Yeah, as much as we would love to uh, be considered operators full-time, we're not. We're combat support under the new mm -hmm. spec war uh, recruiting uh, hierarchy. We're with SEER, kind of the red-headed stepchildren of that, that community with the four other jobs. Um, but at the same time, we're, we're a conventional force under civil engineering with Air Force. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how they have us staged. But we support whoever needs us. So big Army or Air Force, um, you know, special forces, other soft, just whoever. So. Okay. So, I mean, 
the steer guys that I know, they, they go out and they deploy all the time and they still actually, you know, not, they're not termed operators or anything like that, but they still deploy a lot and they get a lot of the same training and like as far as shooting and of course all the seer stuff and all the outdoorsy type of stuff. So it's not like it's a traditional like support type of role Definitely, yeah, where, where yeah. you're just kind of like, you know, envisioning an Intel person or a person that's, you know, CSS and that's, that's a little bit different than the realm that you're in. And obviously it requires a level of, physical activity as well as mental acuity to be able to do those kind of tasks because um you know going back to the hurt locker again everyone's seen how much pressure that there could be in a certain situation absolutely um when you're in a whatever bomb suit you're sweating it's hot and you're trying to like disarm this thing and you know your life is on the line so um you know it also takes uh, a special person I'm, I'm assuming to go out there and do something like that where you know it's it's all you and it whatever is, yeah, whatever yeah. you got going on in your brain that's what's going to save your life absolutely yeah so. we uh we work in small teams uh because of that and the people we attract like you're talking about the tasks we do the the community we have it's a it's an interesting type of person getting hired there's there's a big mix of we have you know jock backgrounds that are just strong more like and then we have guys that are just super mechanically inclined guys that are too smart for their own good but all those things with their weaknesses and strengths combined together in a small team that's what makes us effective and lethal we we kind of we look for the phrase here yeah we just we fill in on each other's weaknesses so yeah i think it's a, yeah we're pretty similar on our teams you know there's always a person who's like super gung ho and they're like i'm going to get this done no matter what and i'm sure that's necessary in certain oh, yeah. parts but it also can get you in trouble especially if you're like no just leave me alone i got this yep. like i'm gonna like you get fixated on this problem and then someone's like like you just get stuck in your own little way and you need that team member to be like hey dude you've been trying for this long like let somebody else get a fresh oh, yeah. look and you know take care of this so i can definitely yeah. see where it'd be a, a team effort to help each other out with the situation that you have to deal with um so keeping that in mind what kind of selection process um, is there for EOD guys and kind of what are you looking for? In a sure. And can, yeah. So right now our selection process just consists of uh, candidates go to basic training if they're not prior service. Uh, once they finish basic training, they go right into Shepherd Air Force Base for a month at our prelim course, which is a little more physically intensive. It's not, it's not BUDS. It's not ANS. Yeah. It's, it's not supposed to be. Uh, it, I, I'd relate it more to like a two-a-day football uh, that just practices every day. It's physically intensive. You get a ruck, you get a run, you get to carry heavy things. But at the end of the day, that course is there to prepare you for Eglin, which is the main EOD schoolhouse. So we hit, uh, at Shepherd, you hit all the basic EOD skills that mm -hmm. are going to be expected once you get to Eglin. So once, uh, once guys graduate from that month-long course, like I said, they go to Eglin, uh, which is a Navy-run school. All oh, four okay. branches attend. Uh, so it's, it's the first exposure a lot of guys have to a joint environment. And then that just continues throughout our career. We're working with you know every every service, every rank, uh, regardless. As long as they have that badge, that's that's all that matters. So, uh, Eglin's roughly eight to ten months. It's uh, it's it's a lot of long days. Yeah. But the, the benefit is, um, all the work is stays at school at the schoolhouse. So when you're done for the day, on on account of classification. So when you're done for the day, you just leave it where it is. Uh, you're off for the day, and you come back and, and re-engage the next day. So. Okay, but during that time, are you getting, like, smoked and no, dropped yeah. and all that stuff, yeah. or just mentally? I've had guys ask me if it's, like, Keesler and other stuff for the controller students, mm -hmm. and that's not the case, yeah. So Eglin is, uh, the end of the day, there's daily PT with the Air Force side specifically, and that PT is intensive. It's led by the instructor cadre, mm -hmm. uh, EOD technicians assigned to the detachment there. But throughout the school day, mostly it's just focused on studying. You're there zero four zero five for study all for a couple hours. And you're you're just booking it until about four or five that night, or knock out PT at the debt, and then you're done for the day. So, Dang! Do you yeah. guys uh, get a degree off of that school from all that stuff? So no. So uh, we do. Uh, our CCAF is in EOD, just like all the rest mm -hmm. of the Air Force jobs. But uh, we actually have to knock out a few more credits because it's a joint service school. Oh. Uh, 
guys like public affairs and a few other schools that go through joint service, they're kind of in the same boat as us, okay. and that the Air Force doesn't recognize the, the Navy's course for some reason. Mm -hmm. Know, Ten months of instruction. Okay, so. but just a couple more credits, and then you can get a degree in EOD. Absolutely, yeah. I knocked out my my CCF, my associates, in uh, maybe a year after getting out station. So, okay, um, cool. And then uh, as far as kind of physical standards, is it the pass test, or do you guys have your own like operational? Like once you're at EOD Tech, like do you have to stick with the Air Force PT test, or do you have like your own? specific like run 100 meters in a bomb suit or do whatever kind of thing we actually uh so right now guys assessing into the the program into eod uh, they're taking the pass test to enlist so for us it's uh three pull-ups and 11 minute uh, mile and a half or less mm -hmm. and that's it that's just to get in the door okay uh, but we just got our tier two pt test approved just like uh, pj's controllers yeah. and tac p um, we've taken through painstaking scientific research. I was on four or five of the TDYs to develop this thing. Uh, it's just, they've knocked down, you know, 140 exercises potentially to test, and they've knocked down to about 10 right now. So all these exercises they're choosing on our new test are directly linked to job tasks that we do. So there's a bunch of science behind it that I could go on for hours. Was about, it so. Doc Baumgartner that it was doing was, that? yeah. All right, yeah. yeah. He used to be one of the instructors when I was yep. in Doc. The man, the myth, the legend, yeah. <laughs> and he used to take us on runs all the time, and it was like, you know, catch up if you can. And then if you tried to, like, get shoulder to shoulder with him, he'd just, like, say, yeah, yeah. take off. And you're like, oh, yeah. stop, come on. He'd be explaining so, his running programs as he's smoking us on the runs usually. So, yeah, I'll get to yeah, he's, yeah, he's a monster. Yeah, and he's still doing it, you know, yeah. after, well, I guess, the first time that it was 15 years ago. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, still a beast. That's Absolutely. good to hear. But, um, okay, so that makes sense. It seems like everyone's going to that, um, you know, operational fitness assessment Absolutely. type of mentality. And uh, I think it's good, yeah. Push-ups, you're not really going to be doing push-ups. Yeah. You might Air be Force doing, crunches. I yeah. mean, I know it's just, yeah, this, that's what makes an operator. This so little yeah, thing, yeah. <laughs> that doesn't really assess too much there. Whether or not you can get out of bed, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. All right, so as far as, <laughs> as far as after you, after you finish the assessment, you're done, you went through your school, which is, how long was the school in? Roughly like a year total? overall, just talking admin time, waiting to get into class. Right. Takes about a year, yeah. All right, so you went through all that stuff. Over a year, you get to your unit. What's it like to be at a unit with the EOD guys and, you know, like kind of a day-to-day -day type of stuff? New guy's a new guy. That's what you, <laughs> yeah. you know how it is. But, yeah, it's uh, uh, you're welcomed with open arms relatively. Uh, there's, they're going to test you uh, skill-wise, physically, emotionally, and just to assess your, your ability as an operator in the field is mm – -hmm. Uh, as a technician, a team leader, I need to know the guys coming out of the schoolhouse, are they up to stuff to be on our teams? And so, yeah, uh, coming into a, a new unit, though, once you, you in process, do your normal thing. Um, for new airmen, it's about another year of OJT, just on the job training, knocking out. Pretty much they've, by graduating EOD school, they've earned the right to start training, just like you guys mm -hmm. with AST. Um, that's pretty much, uh, we just knocked that out in a flight, so... Uh, we're just reteaching them, I wouldn't say properly, but we're reteaching them how we do things operationally uh, as opposed to schoolhouse. And that takes about 12 months. So. Yeah, and I think that's one of the other things that operationally they're trying to change. It was kind of like that whenever I, I graduated. Um, you know, you show up to the team and they're like, all right, like I understand this is how you basic like jump because, you know, like when you jump out, it's like one in a row when you're at, free fall school or whatever mm -hmm. where they give you like a three second hesitation but then now you get into playing with the team and then it's like shoulder to shoulder they're grabbing you and we're all going out together it's like oh we didn't practice that oh, yeah. so uh i'm sure like in a similar manner they're doing um you're trying to like recoup and this is how you do it operationally based on whatever lessons learned because there's all those hurdles that they have to go through to rewrite oh, yeah. the sois and stuff for the training so it's always a couple of years behind. Just like even in medical training. Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm always, you know, I'm learning stuff that was probably at least two to five years in the past. Yep. And there's new stuff, so. Yeah, the biggest recommendation I have for anyone in either of our kind of jobs is just knowing that uh, when you get to a new unit that just 
having the mindset that you don't know anything, keeping your mouth shut, eyes open, ears open, and just going with the flow, whatever the team's doing. That's the biggest, biggest help I've seen new guys come in uh, yeah. that, that, that are successful. Yeah, and just in that line of thought, you know, being the person that always takes out the trash, yep. like, it's always, you're the new guy, you know, pay your dues, it doesn't matter. Whatever other job you came through, you know, I'm a student right now. And I was a PJ for a long time, and I still offer to, like, you know, take out the trash for all of the other people that I'm working with, the doctors, Absolutely. the PAs, the whatever, because I'm a new guy in the career field, and I'm trying to earn my keep and show them that I'm there for the right reasons. Definitely. I'm not there because I'm trying to, like, get whatever badges or medals or any of those kind of things. I'm just trying to do my job and be that person that learns. Like, if you, if you show that you're receptive and that you take whatever they say into action – then they're more likely to try and help you out and try and make you into the best at your job you could be. So, yeah, I definitely agree with um, what you're saying there. I've got to make sure that you're that guy. That's, that's a new guy. But as far as training and um, aside from that mentality that we're talking about, like what does it look like as far as training and day-to-day, TDYs, deployments, that kind of thing? As cliche, I don't want to be cliche right now with uh, there is no normal day, but yeah. there really isn't. Um, we have we support every MAGCOM. Anywhere there's a flying mission, we're going to mm-hmm. be there. So there's a ton of different bases and locations with all unique mission sets. But typically, a lot of shops stateside, uh, they're going to be training roughly two to three days a week uh, dedicated just to practical training or classroom training, uh, whatever tools, procedures we need, because we have a lot of core tasks to keep proficient on and mm-hmm. it's 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 impossible to do to keep maximum proficiency so we're just constantly rotating trying to keep fresh um, but when we're not doing that uh, TDYs are very frequent I've been gone four months out of 2019 just on TDYs alone yeah. um, but that's exactly what I'm looking for and a lot of guys are looking for is that tempo so the deployments aren't what they used to be 2013 or so slowed yeah. down but uh, with that, that purse tempo upcrease with all the TDY increases. So the schools and different training, I just, it's it's limitless what we can do. So. Cool. Um, so what kind of TDYs have you guys going on? Is it like a refresher training? Or are you working with uh, joint services and teaching them how to do stuff? Or all of the above? Yeah, low column A, low column yeah. B, yeah. So uh, it's, it's just lots of different things. We can go... Uh, I've been to different uh, federal agency, you know, post-blast investigation courses with FBI, ATF, uh, CIA, some other agencies, uh, been intelligence collection kind of classes, um, uh, joint exercises with, you know, Marines, Navy, EOD, um, uh, just the whole gamut. We've, uh, January, we spent three weeks just embedded with a, a third group ODA, just helping them out um, as, as their EOD enablers and whatever, you know, DA missions are running or whatever else, so... It's just, it's, training's always there if, if you're able to go find it. So, yeah. um, Cool. What do you think is, I guess, the biggest difference between, because you said you go to school with the Navy, Army guys, so you guys are, it sounds like you guys are, like, working together a lot oh, yeah. and often. So what do you think is the difference between, like, an Air Force EOD guy versus an Army or a Navy or whatever other branch EOD guy besides yeah, the ASVAB scores are we talking yeah. <laughs> oh really <laughs> no, okay. no, no, no. Uh, yeah uh, Navy EOD uh, they're going to be they're actually under Naval Special Warfare mm-hmm. in their classification so um, they still have guys that are just attached to shore deaths doing kind of our mission but on the sea taking care of diving uh, sea mines whatever comes up water ordnance mm-hmm. uh, but then they have guys attached to NSW teams going to do that side mm-hmm. Um, Army, kind of the same thing, just everyone's different in what mission they support. So Army, obviously, Marines have that ground mission first. Air Force is covering that airfield. Uh, that's that's our first priority is getting the jets up, whatever we need to do to make sure those sorties happen. But then after that, once that's complete, that's when we get go tasked out to whatever Army team needs some help or whatever else is going on. So. Okay, yeah. so for the most part, it's just... You know, working the airfields, making sure that all the ordnance that may or may not be safe on planes is taken care of, and that kind of thing. Whereas, you know, Navy if it might be diving or doing something else mm-hmm. like that. Okay. Yeah, that everyone, makes... Everyone's kind of going back, like we were talking about the slowdown a few weeks ago with deployments. You know, yeah. it's not 2010 anymore, just doing raids all day for everybody. So 
uh, with that slowdown, everyone's going back to their core mission sets. Tactic controllers at the 2-1, like, mm-hmm. they're going back to yeah. OG setting up airfields, yeah. and Navy EOD's going back to diving, not just counter ID stuff, and we're all just, uh, we're just, ship, there's a shift going on in a lot of career fields, so understanding, uh, I think that's the most important thing guys can do looking into what job they're interested in, is to find that core mission set that they go to, or that mm-hmm. job does, and make sure that's what they want to do, not just what they're doing at the moment, because that could change. So. Okay. Yeah, that makes total sense. And so, yeah, that core mission set, like you said, you still have deployments. I mean, there mm-hmm. are airfields that are all over the place that you guys are going to need to be there for, and it's not like, I'm sure there's not always, like, oh, there's always a UXO, or there's always, like, you're running to oh, each yeah. different bomb. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, here or there, hit or miss, like, this is what yeah. it's going to be sometimes. You have a lot of work sometimes you don't have a lot of work um and i think that's just like every other job i think some people get somewhat caught up in like you know in this movie this guy's like shooting and then the next morning he wakes up he goes into this other mission and this happens it's no reports in between yeah no, no recount of the gear no, like yeah, they don't even yeah. have time to eat or yeah. use the bathroom they don't yeah. show any of that stuff yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just like no sitting action. waiting for a bird for four hours on the tarmac oh, yeah yeah so, yeah, I think it's important for everyone to realize that even um, with the SEALs, the SF guys I've been employed with, it's the same yep. stuff for everybody. Yeah. Like you said, not, 99% boredom and 1% yeah. just pure terror. So, yeah. You're not going to be over there just Jason Borning, like, in the middle of Afghanistan or Syria, <laughs> picking off targets. Yep. That's not how, how life rolls. Yeah. But, like you said, be specific in the the basic level of training that you want to do with Air Force ED, air, airfield, uh, UXOs, and whatever ordinance needs to be taken care of on the airfields or planes, and then, you know, like pararescue, personnel recovery. So that's pretty much what you got to like. If you want to do that, do one or the other. Yep. Um, so we talked about kind of what the day-to-day looks like and other stuff that you might be expected to take care of. Um, what about specialty type of training um, room for adva- advancement you said you were a EOD team leader um, where, where do you go from like you're basic just out of training and then can you get these other type of schools like advanced EOD technician school or sure that yeah, kind yeah. Of thing? yeah so uh, Air Force is pretty pretty similar across the board for right out of school um, whatever flight you go to your main focus is going to be Upgrading to that is mm-hmm. that basic journeyman team member skill level, um, and then honestly, the missions vary slightly depending on what base you're at. But it's going to be the same of just you know continuing working your skill sets, training up, uh, just doing the same courses a lot of people do until you hit staff and tech that level. Mm-hmm. Once you're team leader qualified, that's when those those splits happen. With uh, yeah, we attend uh, all team leaders go to advanced IEDs, which is just Ad, like advanced bomb technician kind of things uh just we learn some some higher speed kind of stuff um and then there's uh, as far as courses go man, it's weird because we just don't we don't have a, a specific like you guys have just a, like a cfetp list yeah. of courses and we have some of that but the, all the tdys we go to and the courses available it's just uh it's not super standardized, so it just kind of depends on what base you're at. But a lot of common ones, uh, trauma medicine, uh, advanced shooting and tactics, those are going to be your two big ones that most bases hit for all their guys coming in. So, Because okay. we have to be ready to hop hop in the stack or whatever whatever team we're enabling. we got to be at, at least at a level where we're not a liability with a gun because EOD work is maybe 2% of whatever mission we're supporting. And up to that point, we're filling whatever gap needs to be filled on that team. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, you're an extra gun and you're carrying yeah. around stuff. I mean, yeah. they expect you to not just sit in the corner and cry yourself to sleep or anything. Yeah, like I you mean, I do that regardless. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but yeah, that's that's something yeah. that uh, a lot of I've had a lot of guys in my peer group complain about uh, with some new deployments and stuff like that. Is they're being expected to do not EOD work, and that's exactly what we're what we're good at, in my opinion. We're we're enablers because we we problem solve. Like, yeah. I love the things that are way beyond our skill sets or job because it's just a complex problem that we have to find a solution for this team. And we're trusted because of the reputation the last 20 years fighting uh, have, have secured for us. So 
I don't want to do just EOD stuff. I want yeah. to fill in wherever that team needs me. So yeah, I mean that's why any of us joined a job like this is to get into whatever kind of action we can get into and wherever we're needed, do what's asked of us in that situation. Like don't just sit there and do nothing. You're there on deployment for a reason yeah. and utilize your time the best to your ability. Um, so that would mean that if you were to attach to like an army team or something like that, you do the, probably their pre deployment with them and stuff. Or you might, you get like airborne or like assault. So, uh, static line is tough for us just because jump code slots are they're hard to come by for our, mm-hmm. our commanders and money wise and signing off on that safety risk just because there's no, we have very few slots for airborne in Air Force EOD. But air assault, super common. Uh, Ranger school, open for anyone who wants to pursue it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a guy just get his tab last year as a tech. Um, but as far as if we are attached to an Army team, the way deployments go for us is they're all uh, TCAs right now. So we're the Army uh, request forces mm-hmm. in theater. So we have EOD techs that are sitting in places like Kuwait and some other back bases that get pulled to go fill those slots in the team. So they're kind of jumping into the fire with no uh, yeah. no preparation with that specific team. There's training, of course, that goes on pre-deployment-wise mm-hmm. on their side. But for right now, it's just kind of jumping in and filling that that role. But our teams are doing a magnificent job at it. We've got nothing but good reviews from all the Zulus we've talked to, we've worked for them. They, they love Air Force EOD. So. How many EOD guys would you say there are in the uh, Air Force? Total force, maybe 2,000. Uh, don't quote me on that number, but it's 2,000 or less should be. So okay. that's counting uh, reserve, National Guard, and active. So it's still a pretty small type yeah, of community and stuff. Absolutely, okay. yeah. If I don't know someone directly, I'm going to know someone they know. Okay. So, yeah, and uh, do you guys have reserve guard units? or We do, yeah. yeah. So uh, okay. really common, yeah. Just reserve guard, EOD, everywhere. Okay, and any specific, does every base require a EOD guy to be there if they have ordnance like on a on an aircraft or something? Pretty much, yeah. If there's so, a flying mission with even like AMC or Air Mobility Command, if they have uh, cargo planes with flares, we're there for that. Oh, as well. okay. So, so you don't just yeah. travel around with them; you have to be stationed at whatever base they're at. Yeah, that's okay. yeah. That'll like I'm at Seymour. We support the F-15 primarily, so that's our primary mission is getting that mission done. But then, that doesn't take. All, all day, all the time. So once that's complete, we support yeah. whatever else is needed. So, Okay, yeah. totally makes sense. I was just wondering because, you know, with us, we only have, like, a couple bases that we're yeah. allowed to go to. So it yeah. sounds like you're able to just travel all over, and that's why there are a little bit more of you than, I guess, Absolutely. Uh, there are PJs. But, um, and then as far as if a person already has their bachelor's degree, is there an EOD officer or is it a different person than EOD that's in charge of you guys? Or So we have uh, officers Officers run the flight. We have officer billets at every EOD flight. Um, the issue is being under civil engineering. The Air Force requires all our officers to be civil engineers with that engineering degree and background. Oh. And it's a special duty. So they those engineers get pulled, go to EOD school, and then maybe two to four years, one to two tours at a flight before they're yanked back to normal CE. So it's a it's a big issue identified at all levels of the enterprise. Of we can't mentor our officers, and it's we're very senior NCO driven, career field led. So. Yeah. So I guess anyone who is doing that would be more of just I guess you know not to diminish their jobs or duty, but more paperwork oriented and absolutely yeah. you know advocating, making sure that you guys get the missions that you need rather than being a person yeah. or an officer out there with his guys. Yeah. The best EOD officer is that top cover because uh, at the same time if we're talking wartime as well, our LNOs, those those line officers, their liaison between whatever army unit we're supporting or whoever we're under. Um, they're the guy to keep Sergeant Major off us for little things and stuff like that. So that top cover is the biggest job they have. Okay. Um, so it's unfortunate we lose them so quick. Yeah. Can't, can't mentor them very long before they're gone. Yeah, definitely got to get that in line to where, you yeah. know. We try. Yeah, we've been trying for a while. Like, TACP did it. The Navy has it. So, yeah. Yeah, I think um, hopefully they'll reshape. We'll talk about the reshaping here in oh, a little yeah. bit where you that guys find out. worms right there. But, yeah. <laughs> um, so... We'll just get the rest of this stuff out, just primary stuff. Um, opportunities on the outside for guys that are doing the EOD. Obviously, they have EOD and SWAT and all that kind of Absolutely, stuff. Yeah. Um, how easily are you transferable into that kind of stuff? Um, kind of depends on the experience. So a lot of guys uh, 
just like private security, anything else with those shooter type jobs, the market is pretty swamped right now. We've we've been living a counter ID world for yeah. the last 15 years. So if guys are getting out after one enlistment as EOD, it's EOD work is going to be kind of tough to find. But um, if they have more of a background, um, if EOD work is what they're looking for, like bomb squads, stuff like that, they're going to have to join a department, serve their three to five years on patrol, and then try to get on that bomb squad. But as far as other opportunities, because we get top secret clearance and mm-hmm. a lot of other networking with some uh, a lot of government agencies and just good people to know, uh, I'd say the employment's pretty pretty good if guys set themselves up. Yeah, I think, I mean, not that many jobs get top secret clearance yeah, that's, in the military, so just that in itself is easily transferable to whatever government agency you might be. Absolutely. At, so uh, yeah. it's totally worth it. I know you said you kind of got thrown into the fire and stuff. What did you do to prepare yourself, like mentally, physically, um, for this kind of environment? I'm assuming that you played sports and did all that stuff. What do you think like helped you the most to be prepared for for this kind of thing? I was actually not an athlete. I was I was a former what? fat kid in high school. Yeah, I was I was not I was fit, just not an athlete to oh, this okay. day. Anyone can can attest that's watching this and knows me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just. Just preparing for the military in general, just focusing a lot on pull-ups, push-ups, running that base, along with you know doing big compound lifts, deadlifts, uh, mm-hmm. just doing some rucking. General preparation for whatever job I ended up with, because EOD again, I didn't know yeah. anything, so I just knew these dudes deployed and they were gone all the time, so I better be fit. Um, but as far as mental prep, I, I was 17 when I enlisted, so as far as mental prep, I think it it worked out that I didn't know that much because mm-hmm. if I had I probably wouldn't have gone just what I was stepping into because uh, it's it's a little overwhelming at first that school house is a lot of it's a fire hose of information just day in and day out you adjust to it within a few weeks uh, that just kind of that pace of study every day uh, you know study for a day test on that thing and then move on to the next thing kind of rinse repeat uh, but it's it's intimidating to a lot of people. A lot of guys can't can't get a hold uh, of it. And I'm sure, like stepping into a world like that, where everyone probably has some sort of a, a darker sense of humor about yeah. um, the job and about things that you do. Just like you know, we did it in PJs. And even when I hang around, you know, some of the some of the other people that are doctors or whatever, like there has to be a little bit of like, man, not everything is doom and gloom. And you do that with. Yeah, it's the kind of humor that yeah, it's doom and gloom with laughing. That's yeah. That's yeah. I love the shops we go to in our community because of that. Because we deal with very serious situations, and uh, there's there's a lot of mental side effects to that too. And joking about those kind of things, a lot of people are, are worried that that that's an issue. But that is actually how a lot of guys process those things. So that yeah, that sick sense of humor that our reputation precedes us because it's it's true absolutely. Yeah. You and you guys are are sick puppies, so it's uh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm sure that you don't walk into it like, well, I guess I'll just get my whatever blown off or anything like that. But you have to have that level like you respect the yeah you respect yeah. the flame yeah you understand that you can get burned by it, but you got to be able to you know absolutely yeah you got to compartmentalize yeah. just like. I'm sure you guys always had, you know, a joker on the team who was, there's always a guy who's, who's helpful to get that, that icebreaker going whenever there's mission planning or something like that. But then he has to know when to shut it off too. So yeah. it's, it's that balancing game. So. Yeah, it's that, it's that fine balance. Yeah. yeah. That you have to, yeah. and I, I'm sure walking off the street and jumping into that, you're like, whoa, what are these guys talking about? These guys are crazy. Like, yeah, Honestly, coming off, you know, because I've always kind of had that sense of humor, so that was the oh. only like saving grace for me <laughs> with the instructors. But just learning, you know, bombing a couple times with trying to do jokes like that initially was just that was kind of uh, getting used to that environment. Yeah. yeah. So, but as far as the schoolhouse goes, um, you know, being 17, I relied heavily on my fitness and humor and attitude because I did I didn't even know how to work a ratchet strap, let alone like this. <laughs> I was useless mechanically, just technically. Yeah. So it was a lot of just trusting whatever they were saying. I didn't fully understand a lot of the concepts at the time, but I'm going to trust what they're saying and just figure it out as I go. Yeah. And it worked out, and I'm here. So. Yeah, yeah, that cargo or ratchet strap is something that they didn't teach us in school either. Yeah. And it was just, they, they threw it to me, and I was like, uh, yeah. how to 
what do I do with this? Yeah. And then there's <laughs> you're at your first unit, and there's nine dudes there. It's like, are you an idiot? Oh, cool. Like God. I'm not. I'm not an idiot. I swear, yeah. I can figure this out. <laughs> I've never seen this before. Oh, yeah. So, but yeah, little things like that. I mean, you're always going to be tested. And like mm-hmm. I said, I think attitude goes a long way. And like we were talking about in the beginning, if you show that you're willing to do whatever it takes and work toward it, you're not going to like lose your shit because you can't figure something out you just sit there and you know like work with it the best you can and then eventually someone would be like hey just do this and pull the handle and then open it yeah yeah and that's yeah that's the biggest thing taking that the ribbing and some of it can get pretty intense just the the back and forth of the guys but they're looking for your reaction to see how you respond because if you can't handle that then i'm not going to trust you to handle when we're three days deep into a mission and we're, we think we're done and then there's a follow on for another 12 hours or something ridiculous like that. So those stressful situations we can test pretty easily with training and uh, some stress inoculation. Um, I think one of the things that we didn't really touch this is kind of like going back a little bit, but um, civilian mission sets that you guys might be able to do like, I guess more during peacetime and stuff like that. How how can you guys integrate into that while you're like on the base and you, I'm sure you guys are always like someone's in a ready position or you have like, you know, your EOD phone. Definitely. And, yeah. We have a cell phone standby. Yeah. So we'll have two or three man team, depending on the shop, just waiting for that call whenever it comes. Um, like I said, our main mission is that base supporting that base, whatever their flying mission or whatever they're doing is. Uh, but we also support the surrounding community. So if any, you know, America is covered in old munitions, just, World War Two, we were just dumping right. things left and right and just, you know, screw the environment kind of thing. <laughs> so there's always stuff popping up or veterans passing away and their kids go clean their attic out and there's grenades or mortars from Vietnam, uh, stuff like that. It's very <laughs> frequent. Uh, North Carolina, yeah, that, yeah. yeah, North Carolina, they, uh, they used to uh, quarry with dynamite in the 50s and 60s. So there's just, like, uh, day after Christmas a few years ago, they called up, there was 100 pounds of dynamite sitting in a barn that they resp- or we responded to, so... <laughs> just you'll never know what's gonna come come through your your desk, but uh, yeah, we support all the a lot of states don't have bomb squads, so we are that support uh, in case they have you know pipe bombs stuff like that. We just had a team uh, help out the uh, North Carolina SBI squad with some pipe bombs a couple weeks ago. So yeah, there's always something to do stateside, whether it's training or a big box of dynamite when you're supposed to be on leave. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so do you have any like specific deployment or any other cool stories that you can share with the guys that are watching this right now? Yeah. Um, so yeah, my, I'm about to go on my second deployment. It's going to be cooler than my first (laughs) sat sat in Kuwait the first time. Yeah. Um, still uh, knocked out a ton of training, got to do, um, you know, a lot of people complain about back-based deployments, but at the end of the day, you're getting, you know, tax-free money to work out three times a day and just have time to knock out school. And then on top of that, we're doing a ton of training, uh, just doing massive range demolition shots, Mm -hmm. like 10,000 pounds and up of explosives, you know, every week at least. So there's just, there's always opportunities to seize. And then when those good ones come down, like I lucked out on one coming up this year, um, you just kind of, it's, it's kind of roll the dice, but you just, you get what you get. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when I was on deployment with some Navy EOD guys, um, they had a bunch of uh, things that were expiring. I think it was, oh, yeah, yeah. I, don't know how many, I don't know how many hundreds of pounds yep. it was of stuff, but we had to build, uh, dig three different holes to put this stuff in. And there was a bunker that we set behind. We had like time stuff and it was just like blowing up all the, it was, it was pretty awesome. So yeah, they, cool. they yeah. made me like go in the hole and, you know, do all the, the wire and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, I have a picture of me like just, sitting in a hole with a bunch of stuff and a bunch of C4 oh, yeah. and yep. other stuff in my hands like man I'm I don't know I'm just trusting these guys hopefully yeah, yeah. they know what they're doing because I'm you know yeah, I'm not an EOD tech I don't know about bombs yeah. but it was, it was a lot of fun so I'm sure you guys That's get good. to do a lot of stuff um, like that and you know demolition type of work and you have to know how everything works so absolutely yeah. obviously you're gonna have to figure out how to blow it up yeah because there's there's a ton of guys that can use explosives we got combat engineers even you guys get some explosive basic use right so more cct guys than pj yeah. pjs are really uh, i've seen some controllers shake some blasting caps pretty hard like, yeah i can call in some crazy airstrikes but a blasting cap well but, <laughs> no but uh yeah so there's a lot of dudes that can use basic explosives but we go we go deep we explosive theory blast effects 
how to mitigate those things down to the minutia to keep people safe, minimum distances. There's just there's a ton of stuff guys can know if they choose to actually apply and study and memorize these kinds of things. And that's where those those technicians that are worth reading about that's they they did all that. So yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, just like any of the people that you read about that have all these awards and we're in the right place at the right time you know if you go all in take your job seriously and anytime that you know something comes up you're going to be the guy that they call because they know like man i can really depend on merit to go out there and freaking take care of whatever task i might have just like when you play football so um yeah it's good stuff and then so i think we talked about a lot of stuff with eod is there any parting shots um, things that you guys think um, or things that you think a person should do if they're trying to get ready for EOD, specifically uh, mentally, um, physically, whatever kind of stuff that you see as far as weaknesses Definitely. of guys coming in, what, what kind of things can they do to prepare? Uh, physically, big, big cardio base. That's going to help no matter what job they do. You know, that, that endurance base is huge. Um, rucking, I'd suggest, as long as they're doing it appropriately, you know, there's tons of plans out there. Go find a good one and, mm-hmm. and dedicate to it, but be safe about it. Um, and then big lifts, deadlift, squat, uh, anything with core and leg stability, and then farmer's carries and pull-ups. Those are going to be your biggest things to help you through because uh, we carry heavy stuff a lot. And so it's, no matter what we do, whether it's a bomb suit stateside or being in a level A Kim suit for four hours, it gets heavy too, And just or just being in kit carrying 70 pounds of gear on five-day dismount stuff like that so guys got to be ready for whatever that right that so calls be able for. to i guess it's more akin to like a tack p type workout be able to carry heavier things yep. uh mostly land-based type of stuff absolutely yep. and obviously just like any other job um that's operational make sure that you can do cardio because Definitely. you never know when you know, that mission's going to end. So yeah. you got to be able to get out of there on your feet. Like, yeah, your abs are cool, dude, but yeah. when you're falling out after 30 minutes on the ruck, it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they got to find that balance. So, yeah, tell guys, always train operationally. Who cares about, like, the six-pack, the the big fat arms and stuff? I've seen a lot of students who they were jacked, and they probably could have been a freaking whatever kind of model on a magazine, but they couldn't do five pull-ups. It's like, man, um, those muscles look cool, but they're not going to get you to where you need to get. So focus more on operational type of training. That's what I stress a lot of dudes. Absolutely. Um, Mentally and academically. Yeah, yeah. mentally, um, like we were talking about, just be ready for stress. There's, It's just any pipeline. You're going to be long days of stress. Uh, EOD is a lot more academically based stress. There's a lot of classroom learning on top of practical exercises of what you just learned. Um, just being able to perform while people are watching, talking to you, making fun of you, it's those are all built in to assess your ability to work under those pressures. So when it's a combat situation or something where it's really life or death, uh, you you have a little bit of feeling what that's like. Um, as far as academically, there's not much. A lot of guys ask me what they can study before they mm-hmm. go. There's not much you can do. Yeah. Everything's so unique. Um, as long as you have basic math down, uh, which is iffy for me, but <laughs> yeah, as long as you have basic yeah. math down and some good note-taking skills and study skills, uh, you should be fine. Um, just, uh, it's a lot of cramming, to be honest. So I, I saw a lot of guys come from college where they had developed good study habits, actually struggle because EOD school, you know, you can't take anything home. So guys like me who would cram always in school, usually succeed more because we're just reading our notes right before tests stuff like that so it's a weird environment to be sure yeah i think i'm kind of like you what you're talking about i I do the same thing even now in pa school i wait until like the the last minute to to study for whatever test that i'm doing because you know i don't feel the pressure until you get close to time like man all right i gotta start studying boris you know whenever that crunch time comes down to it, like, all right, now I need to focus, yeah, yeah. and I'm going to put 100% into it. Every paper. But so. we have so many things that we're just trying to do all the time. So, yeah, yeah it's time management. Absolutely. But I think uh, that's that's how I work best, too, is yeah. just under pressure and just, you know, get stuff done. But um, I think that's not something that you can do physically. It's something that you can do for the mental aspect. Uh, but physically, you need to be ready, I'm sure, before long in advance because your body's not going to be able to 
um, adapt quickly enough for you to be ready for like carrying heavy things, especially because a lot of guys end up getting shin splints or getting Absolutely. whatever other kinds of injuries. Once We're, if they try and go like I'm going to do a 50 pound farmer's carry in each hand for a mile, yeah. right off the gate, they're probably not going to be able to do it, or they're going to tear something because they've never done it before. So. Build up all the way. I have no doubt ANS has been seeing the same thing. We are at Shepherd with just guys coming off the street now. It's not even that they didn't play sports. It's we get kids, they're eighteen kid, eighteen year old kids. They're just coming off like have never walked on their own before. It seems like <laughs> low bone density guys getting yeah. shin splints just from running on a gravel path or yeah. stuff like that. So yeah, just doing anything physically to get a help because. We were just talking about, you know, abs don't matter, stuff like that. But also your appearance and fitness are, those are the two easiest things you can do to build your reputation. Because it starts just like your guys' pipeline. Your reputation in the career field starts from day one when you get off that bus. So if you're fat, I don't want anything to do with you until yeah, you prove that's, otherwise. That's like the other thing is the extreme. Yeah. Don't go to the yeah, extreme yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, <laughs> of anything where you're like, yeah. well, like curry stuff, but yeah. like. Yeah. And then if you're frail, like it's the same thing. I don't want any, So just yeah. find that middle ground. Or if you do look like that and just genetically unfortunate, be able to perform. Because yeah. I've had dudes like that too where looking at them, uh, I don't know, but then they're out there and they're hauling like. Robots and one five fives with in both hands or something. Like, okay, I'll take you. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah as right. long if as you can perform. Yeah, like, yeah. Right, yes. Can't so. really uh, say anything bad about that. Yeah, probably gonna get made fun of a little bit, <laughs> but you know that's just the nature of the beast. Yeah, you get made fun of for whatever kind of thing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, just <laughs> anything that they can pick out. They'll look for any reaction. That's what. That's all. They're just working down the board of potential things to insult you on until yeah. they get that reaction. So. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so things that last thing I want to talk about is just like things that inspire you and why you do the job that you do what gets you up in, in the middle of like what gets you up in the morning you're like man I love doing this right now I really enjoy it what kind of things are you thinking about uh, I'd say my biggest thing is just being able to train other guys right now because I've worked in our training section for about a year in the flight Mm-hmm. And just, I've been blessed with some extraordinary leadership, mentorship, and training opportunities, and just like being able from anything from like like I was talking about integrate with third group, um, being able to train up a couple ODAs before they deploy, like those their their engineer sergeants emailing us saying, hey, we we, we defeated an IED today successfully because really? what you guys taught us stuff like that, uh, that's just it's huge and just all the different things EOD has to offer are just tremendous and just stuff you would never expect and it allows guys like me with no real background in anything before that the chance to go do things that are way beyond what I should be able to you know assessing for special units or uh, just whatever else is out there so being able to pass that on and be in that top cover that training for the new guys coming behind me that's that's the biggest motivation I have yeah absolutely leaving your legacy making it better than when you found it absolutely and then I'm sure you know waking up and every day's a new adventure, a new thing like you were talking about. Not every day is the same. I think that's what gets a lot of us out of bed in the morning is you're like, yeah. man, what am I going to do today? Like, there, what what kind of thing? And I mean, to be fair, there are days where it's Groundhog Day in the yeah. office, you know, knocking out reports just like any job, you know, freaking HRT, any high-speed unit, there's yeah. going to be days where it's just like, this sucks. Yeah, yeah I got to do a report, got to file this evidence. Mm-hmm. And there are days like that where are conventional force, and there's probably more days like that than in an STS or other squadrons like that. But uh, at the end of the day, it's the biggest thing I think of is just, you know, I joined for that, that war, and I kind of missed it in that, that window, uh, just barely. Um, but the guys behind me, I don't know when the next conflict is. And mm-hmm. to not prepare those guys is a disservice to them and all the guys who who paid that price to learn those lessons before me so trying to uh even if i'm not able to go do the job the way that i thought i would be able to when i enlisted um being able to be that that uh, middleman and passing on the lessons i got taught directly from those guys to the new crew that's in itself a reward and that's why you're here right now to show these guys kind of what you're about and what you could do, opportunities as an EOD guy, and hopefully, you know, as you go down the line, they'll recognize you and be like, oh man, thank you for, you know, talking on this video, 
you were the one that inspired me to do this stuff and you know passing it down the motivation because we don't know when the next big war is going to be like you said right now we're in a uh, somewhat peaceful time mm-hmm. obviously there are guys that are still deployed and uh going out there and getting stuff but right now we have a little bit of time to focus and build ourselves up make sure that we're ready to go for whatever is asked of us next so yeah i appreciate you coming out here and talking to all these guys like we said the most important thing for you guys is not to just do one specific job or whatever because you don't like it i want you guys to be informed and so does merit he wants you guys to like be as informed as possible choose your thing that you love to do stay with the basic basic mission set just like you were talking about because you're not going to be branched out into so many things right now we're not in high war time so I, yeah we want guys who are who want to do this job at its core not not get lied to and get in the door like the the past few years model mm-hmm. of recruiting that's that's not the goal of this page not what we're, we're we're about we're trying to you know just put information out so we can get the right people in who want to do this job at its core exactly and you guys um, you know I say it all the time but you're in a position where the world is your oyster you can just go on YouTube uh, whatever other channels that are out there and learn about whatever job career field choose your path so I urge you guys to you know take the initiative learn about whatever career field you're interested in and do your best to know that know what you're getting yourself into because there's no reason to not know what you're getting yourself mm-hmm. into so before we close out, there's just one thing that I want to talk about, and it's the future of Air Force Special Warfare, because there's been a lot of talk on the other guys that I've been talking to. Mm-hmm. I did an interview with a guy who's a special reconnaissance, and then some of the CCT PJs, they're all talking about this new change that's coming. So how does EOD fit into this whole new you know, machine that they're building? It's a loaded question right there. Uh, yeah, I know. Well, yeah, I'll give you can't get specific yeah, answers, yeah. of course, like yeah, everything this, else. But um, I'll, Just the background of what we know. Uh, with the, the SECAS vision, 2030 Battlefield Airman mm-hmm. vision, or Special Warfare vision, um, EOD was briefly mentioned as a possibility to insert into whatever Air Force ODA construct or whatever they're trying to make. Um, and we, we make sense in that mission. We filled in before, mm-hmm. but... Again, this is just my conjecture, a lowly NCO. I don't, I don't have control over this at all. Yeah. Um, I think we do fit in that mission, but uh, whether we completely leave to go special warfare or stay civil engineering or wherever we're going next, that is very up in the air over the next, I'd say the next five years, we'll have a more solid answer. Um, I think our integration into further into AFSOC is going to increase uh, the way I've seen things go. But I would encourage guys not to join on that whim. If if you don't want to go soft and special forces, that kind of thing, go pursue 18x contracts or uh, you know actual spec war jobs. Mm-hmm. Go go for the known because EOD probably will be involved in something in the future, or maybe not. We just don't know. So uh, just I would go for the known if soft is your end goal. Yeah, like you said. All this is stuff that we're, we're planning on doing and might happen, whatever. Go for the core mission set, like you said in the beginning. But I do see a role for EOD or even like whoever else on the team because the way that I've been told it's going to roll down is you know some of the guys are interchangeable based on the mission set. You know, If there's a EOD type mission set, then we need a guy who's going to be able to insert with us. And if our insertion method is going to be airborne halo whatever other kind of thing then that would i mean it it would be obvious that you guys would need to do that again you're not joining just because of any qualifications or any of that kind of stuff but that's what makes sense you know if we're trying to execute that kind of mission and we need a guy who can do that and those conversations have have happened and are happening but it's uh, the powers that be of some yeah it's it's on a priority list somewhere, so <laughs> we'll see what happens. I'd say next five years we'll see yeah. a product. Okay, so, well, yeah. I, I could definitely see something like that happening um, in, the, in the future by at least 2030. Yeah, for well, sure. I mean, we have a small it's gonna be. a small direct support presence already, but uh, nothing on that, that uh, just yeah. normal SW side right now. So, All right. I think that about wraps it up. Um, 
If you guys have any more questions about EOD, make sure you contact Merritt over on the Air Force, Join Air Force EOD page on Instagram. Um, and then also I'm going to be integrating into my website, BAPJ.com, a couple of the basic career field questions that I sent him. He filled out and answered on BAPJ.com under the uh, resources tab. Click on EOD. I'm going to be filling out more SW career fields on there so we can get you guys as much information as possible and make sure that you make the most informed decision that you can make about which career field you want to join within the Air Force Special Warfare umbrella. Thanks again, and we will see you next time for our next video.